In an industry stuffed with marketing bullshit, empty promises, and shiny suited liars, one woman's had enough. She knows what it's like to have the wrong clients, no money, and no time for fun. But she also knows how to fix it. And on the Business for Superheroes show, she promises to tell the down and dirty truth about business, sales, and running away with the circus. Here's your host, Vicki Fraser. Hello and welcome to the Business for Superheroes show. I'm Vicky Fraser and I'm here with Joe. Hello. Cool. Um, there's, there's less gin this week, um, or at least there's less gin all over us, so that's that's a good thing. And this week, I'm we're, well, we're going to be nattering about niches or niches if you're in America. I don't really know why it's called, why they call it niches. Why do they call it niches? Because they have to pronounce every letter or remove it. Okay. I don't know. No, I, I kind of, I kind of like it. It makes me chuckle. Anyway, today we're talking about niches, and I'm going to start with a little rant about Japan, because frankly, if Japan would stop murdering whales, I reckon that I could think it was a splendid place. I quite like the culture, and I'd like to go and visit, and I like their little gardens and all the rest of it. But part of the reason I think it could be a splendid place is because they have a taboo against chewing gum. Which I think okay. is quite cool because I think chewing gum is minging. It's pretty gross. Yeah. Do you remember the school days where you would touch the underside of a desk and there would be somebody's gross discarded chewing gum stuck under there? Yeah, yeah, pretty horrid. Yeah. Have you ever had chewing gum in your hair? No, no, I haven't. No, I've had chewing gum in my hair and it basically means that you have a chunk cut out of your hair because you really can't remove it. Hmm. Did, did you, uh, talking about things in your hair, did you, did you hear, did you see the picture of the woman who used expanding foam as hair gel? Oh, uh, hair mousse. No. She squirted the wrong can into her hair and it went like massive and yellow and then set. <laughs> okay. I'll find you a picture later. Okay. Um, dear readers, I will I will put that picture on the podcast page when <laughs> Joe finds it for me because that sounds awesome. There might be um, a business opportunity for people in there who want massive yellow hair. Massive yellow hair. I don't know. Anyway, back to Japan and chewing gum. Um, chewing gum's fucking disgusting, frankly. It's horrible. It sticks to your shoe. It makes a mess of everything. And people who chew gum near me, I honestly, I, it makes me want to punch them in the face. It's just grim. Anyway, when I'm in charge of the world, anyone caught with chewing gum will be kneecapped, frankly. Anyone caught disposing of it anywhere but in a bin will be summarily executed. But chewing gum is not welcome in Japan. Do you know why? Because they feel much the same way as you about it. Possibly, but actually it's because the Japanese have a taboo against taking food out of their mouths. Really? Yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing in Japan, which actually I think is perfectly reasonable because there is re- if you're not a toddler, there's really no reason to take food out of your mouth, ever. I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day and he's just come back from China and they really love taking things out of their mouths because they'll, they'll put whole duck heads in and suck all the bits off and gnaw on them and then spit out the stuff they haven't they can't they don't want to eat okay i think we're wandering into the yeah. realms of slight xenophobia here but it's what he said <laughs> anyway the japanese have a taboo against taking food out of your mouth which i'm fully in favor of because if you're not a toddler then you know what goes in should stay in but because you shouldn't really swallow chewing gum and i don't really know why that is because i don't think it does you any harm well it like wraps around your heart or something doesn't it well, if if <laughs> you're one of those people, children. <laughs> if you're one of those people who believes internet stories, then yes, it does, and it stays in your stomach for seven years until it develops into some kind of a chewing gum monster. But anyway, you don't you're not supposed to swallow chewing gum, basically. And so, you, what do you do? You take it out of your mouth. But the Japanese don't because there's a taboo against it. So, what do you do? <laughs> imagine, Im- let's imagine that you have some chewing gum and you want to sell it in Japan. What do you do? You can't sell the chewing gum because they won't take the food out of their mouths. Okay. So, there's a guy called, and I have to read this because I can't pronounce very well, Taichiro Morinaga. Taichiro Morinaga. Yeah. He came up with a brilliant idea in 1931 and he developed tulips, apparently. He already made caramel, or his business already made caramel, but he combined it with strawberry flavouring to create edible chewing gum. And... Apparently, after World War II, he had to like rebuild his company. 
because I guess a lot of things fell apart in World War II. But when he did, his edible chewing gum came back with a vengeance and he called it Hi Chew. And I said it like that because it's all capital letters. But there is a product out there called Hi Chew. Hi Chew. Hi Chew, which sounds a bit like haiku, which is awesome. I like haikus. If anyone ever wants to please me, send me a haiku. Anyway, he'd managed to find a really profitable niche. And this is the whole point of me telling telling this story. I'm not just rumbling about Japan here. So anyway, haichu is now a really popular thing in Japan. The kids like it, the grown-ups like it. It's chewing gum that you can swallow without, you know, growing a chewing gum monster in your belly. Cool. Yeah. This dude's made a lot of money, and he's made an awful lot of money by finding a very profitable niche. Which is what you should do if you want to make a lot of money. If you're in any doubt, finding and cultivating a niche can be extremely profitable. Joe, tell our dear listeners about your niche. What do you do? What does your company do? Oh, man. We make inspection systems for automated manufacturing companies, often FMCG, that's fast-moving consumer goods, um, like packets of crisps and bottles of pop and all that kind of stuff. And a well-known noodle in a pot product a well-known noodle in a pot product whose dusty residue i have yet to successfully wash out of my hair (laughs) this is true he smells odd chili beef folks chili beef it's not good cool but the point is that (laughs) all of these companies you know they have they they have they, they make whatever it is that they make so you know let's let's imagine there's bottled goods going down a thing a, a conveyor belt and they have a problem that you know, perhaps the cap's not on properly, or perhaps the barcode isn't fully readable, or perhaps things are being rejected yeah, because the tamper band is getting cracked when they apply the lid, or they're putting it, they're printing a promotional code on the label on the fly, and it turns out that some of them aren't readable. Yeah, that kind of thing. And Joe's particular niche is that his company, well, not his company, but the company, um, goes in there and it does what pretty much nobody else can really do or not do very well. Hmm. There are other companies who do it, but obviously not as well as us. And we're we're geared up to support. Um, we're, we're not a one man band, so we can we can operate in multiple countries with multiple engineers doing multiple projects at the same time, which not many people can. Yeah, and part of the reason, by the way, that that Joe's company is is so very good at what they do is because they don't just work in in one industry. Their niche, if you like, is that. They've worked in automotive, they've worked in pharmaceutical, they've worked in fast-moving consumer goods, they've worked in other things as well. And they bring... Food, pharmaceutical, yeah. Yeah, they bring their experience in all of those different areas to a problem that other people think are unsolvable. That's that's their niche. They solve problems that are said to be unsolvable by Hmm. the company. I mean, how many times have you had someone come to you saying, oh, we've we've got this problem and nobody can... Nobody can do it. Oh, that's why they come to us, generally. Yeah, that's all why the they time. come to All the time. So don't just think of a niche as being, you know, a section of, say, you know, a section of the fetish world that's specifically dominated to licking people's boots. That is a niche, but that's, you know, not... And that's a, a story I shall, <laughs> I shall tell about in a minute. Okay. That, that is a niche, but you can also think of a niche as being you doing something that nobody else can do or that nobody else has managed to do. And in Joe's company's case, it's working in a lot of different industries and being able to solve problems that nobody else can solve mm. for, a, for a wide variety of reasons. Yeah. A lot of these places have people who've worked in them forever mm. and they've never seen anywhere else. So taking something that seems really obvious in the automotive world and, and placing it into a food factory is like uh, it's like wizardry. Yeah, They've never seen it before and they think it's magic, which it pretty much is. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, having just been around the block a few times and seen lots of different places, you, you get you get to see some good things. It's good. Yeah. It's good fun. It is cool. So, yeah, niching. That's that's pretty much what a niche is, really. You can you can go a couple of different ways. You can It can be your USP, if you like. And, you know, my, my niche is small businesses, particularly freelancers, who are very much like me. And that's another niche. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the boot-licking variety of fetishists. Which, or... which, is, which is not like you, right? No, a friend of mine was once offered five hundred pounds to go to somebody's house and lick his boot. Uh, no, and have him lick her boots. True story. Five hundred pounds. Mm. Did she go? Yes. Don't blame her. I know. I would too. <laughs> True story. Anyway, so that's a niche, and then also you know Joe's thing is a niche, and then 
my choice, my very specific choice of people that I want to work with is also a niche. It might not look like a niche on the face of it, but it is because I only work with very specific types of people. Mm. Your niche is people. Your niche is the people that you choose to work with, isn't it? The- yeah. And also also it's um, freelance copywriters because I've been there. That's a, a very good niche for me to be in. So, and, and by extension, freelance designers and editors and translators and all the rest of it. Yes, small businesses as well, but really I specialise in specialise in freelancers I guess anyway if, if you're still wondering why I mean you might be wondering why why choose a niche because if you, basically it's because if you do that you're marketing to a single ideal customer and you might be a little bit worried about that because you'll have a far smaller audience but it's an audience that's far more likely to buy from you and they will buy from you at a higher price Joe how much more expensive are you guys than your competitors it's difficult to say because we do such a wide range of things for a variety of people, but um, we are not cheap at all. No, and nor should not you be, because you can solve problems that nobody else can. <laughs> Seriously, the more you niche, the the smaller your target audience, the more money that the more money you can charge, because people will pay a premium for for a service that nobody else can deliver. I, I guess if you if you provide if you design your service to appeal to everybody, you'll then... appeal to nobody. Yeah, you'll appeal to nobody, but you, you'll you'll find yourself instead of solving a hundred percent of somebody's problem, you'll solve sixty percent of a lot of people's problem, and that's that doesn't work because people don't want a sixty percent solution. No, they don't want it sixty percent right. They want it absolutely spot on for them. Yeah, and you also triggered something else in my head then, and I've now forgotten it, but I will come back to it if I remember it. So the thing about niching is that you you really can't compete with the likes of Apple and Coca-Cola and, you know, that kind of mass market company. And it's it's more than likely a waste of your time trying. And right at the beginning, Apple and Coca-Cola and, for example, Levi Strauss didn't compete with the mass market either because they all started off as tiny companies. And I'm now going to tell you a little story about Levi Strauss jeans because it's a really good example of finding a niche. A really good example. So, Joe, you know all about Levi Strauss jeans, right? I, I know what they are. Exactly. And you've probably had a pair at some point. I probably have. Probably have. Everybody wears jeans. And, you know, now it's not just it's not just Levi Strauss jeans. It's jeans everywhere. Jeans are a... They're yeah. like Hoover, I guess. Yes. And, yeah. Everybody wears them. Everybody has a pair of jeans. I don't, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a pair of jeans. I think even my gran has a pair of jeans. Really? And she's like 93, which is pretty cool. Jeans are now a mass market item. They are worn by everybody all over the world. You know, rich people and poor people in all cultures, in all societies, pretty much. And I actually really like expensive jeans. True religion jeans, I can't be doing it, because cheap jeans are shit. Anyway, slight, uh, slight diversion. But they didn't start off as mass market clothing, is my point. And the original jeans didn't re- or don't resemble today's blue jeans very much. So imagine you're working down a mine, and imagine your trousers fall down, and imagine it's 1871. It's going to be kind of embarrassing and it's going to be a little bit dangerous, right? Because mines don't really want to be not wearing trousers. Mines, trousers around ankles, 1871. Okay, yeah. I've got it. <laughs> so what are you going to do? I mean, the, the problem the problem is... I'm going to drop my shovel. You're going to drop, you're going to drop your shovel, yes. <laughs> the, the, problem, the problem that these miners have is that every time they do something strenuous or they catch their, their trousers on something, they basically break. They rip or the fly breaks or, you know... Okay. Or whatever, and you, you probably don't want your fly breaking when you're in a mine because there's all kinds of moving parts and, you know. People swinging picks. People swinging picks for the love of, you know, all that is unholy. Anyway, in 1871, there was a tailor named Jacob Davis, and he lived in Reno, Nevada. And he had a big problem because the miners who wore his jeans or his trousers, as they were, I guess they were called at the time, kept finding themselves without pockets or zip flies. Well, not zip flies, it would have been button flies back then. Because they just couldn't stand up to the abuse. And, you know, this this caused a lot of problems, including, you know, the, the trousers around the ankles. And one day, the wife of one of the miners went to Taylor Jacobs' shop and asked him to create a pair of trousers that really could withstand some abuse. So what did the tailor do? What would you do? Um, I would start, I don't know. Okay, I would, I would, I, I would read the notes and I would look at, um, really sturdy things like 
horse harnesses and saddles. I'd go to a saddler and I'd say, how do you stitch your stuff together so it doesn't fall to pieces? That's what I'd do. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> so any, anyway, that is exactly what Taylor did. because it's this amazing. Because this is what you do when you have a problem. You don't just go, oh, I don't know how to solve it. And, you know, you, you think creatively and creative thinking is going and looking at other things. And in this guy's case, he looked at, you know, horse harnesses, sturdy bags, mail bags, that kind mail of thing. Bags. Mail bags. And what he found was metal fasteners and rivets and canvas. And, you know, stuff that didn't fall apart. And that's what he built his new trousers. Built. That's what he, he made his new trousers out of. And the local miners loved them because the rivets strengthened the stress points and the cloth was, it was called duck cloth. And it was really durable and it was a type of canvas that just refused to rip. I don't know if you've ever tried to rip a pair of jeans that hasn't already got a hole in, but it's practically impossible if it's decent quality jeans. Although your pockets always seem to rip. Anyway, lots of keys. Lots of keys. So anyway, he knew he was onto something big because he had these trousers that were no longer rippable. And what he did was turn to Levi Strauss, who was a German immigrant who ran a dry goods franchise. And they took out a patent on riveted pants. Riveted pants. Riveted pants. Or trousers, as they're known on this side of the ocean. Yes. And the point is, of all, the, the point of this story is that um, the tailor, Jacobs and Levi Strauss, they didn't try and sell it to everybody at this stage because they had a new, a new thing. Their market was a miner, a miner who needed a strong pair of trousers. He had, at this point, a really, really small niche market. It started off just with miners in his local town. And then the word spread and he started selling to other hardworking outdoorsy types like, I don't know, ranchers and builders and tradesmen and dockers and, you know, people who need trousers that will basically not fall apart if you do some work in them and that's that's who he sold to and it wasn't until much much later that you know they, they started being worn and noticed by the likes of you and me okay his niche was men who needed trousers that would stay up in a mine <laughs> in a mine it's a niche. <laughs> it isn't it is a niche it's very niche but you know seriously his his he recognised a specific problem. Jacob Davis recognised a specific problem within a very specific group of people and he made his trousers just for them. He did not try to sell scattergun like most small businesses do. He didn't make these trousers and then go, I need to sell them to everybody. He recognised the, the precise people who wanted them and needed them and sold to them and did very, very well out of it because, you know, Levi Strauss is a, a global name now. I think a lot of small businesses try and sell to everybody out of panic. Hmm. The more people they try and sell to, the more money they'll make. Yeah. I remember getting a question quite early on, uh, sorry, early on this year, actually, but from somebody who'd, who'd answered my what are your three biggest challenges in your business question. And she'd said that her biggest challenges were that she, I can't remember how she put it, but she said that she needed to reach as many people as she possibly could because they weren't selling much of their stuff, which is utterly arse backwards. Because yeah, her conversion rate was low. Yeah, that's that was it, yes. She needed to reach as many people as possible because her conversion rate was low, which is entirely the wrong way to go about things because what that meant that she would be doing would be spending a fortune on advertising to everybody and anybody, not appealing to any of them mm. because she'd just be doing beige marketing and getting probably an even lower conversion rate, whereas what she should have been doing was identifying her absolute ideal customer and just targeting the adverts at them, which would be a far smaller pool of potential customers, but she'd get a far higher conversion rate if she did a good job of the adverts and the landing pages. And, and answering their needs. And answering their needs, exactly. Exactly. So, basically, you, dear listener, like Jacob Davis and Levi Strauss, will get a much better return on investment if you find a niche for yourself. Otherwise, you'll be a tiny fish in a massive ocean, and you'll be competing with a million other people and your product will be bland, and your marketing will be shite, and you will spend a lot of money, and you won't sell much. What you want is a, a sniper approach. Be a sniper. Be a marketing sniper. I guess from the, the customer point of view, if if they're looking for the, the thing that they need, they're either going to find they're going to find a couple of people who've sort of targeted someone like them, but they're not quite accurate, and they're you know, there's their product satisfies some of your needs, but it doesn't satisfy all of them. And then there's you who have totally focused everything on them because they're perfect. Yeah. And 
they're going to look around and they're going to go, well, this is all right and that's okay and this is 60% and that's all right. But this person over here, they understand what I want and they've got it 100% right and I'm going to go and buy off them, even if it is more expensive because yeah. they've got it right. It's absolutely spot on. And they don't need to go anywhere else for anything else. If you can, this is another really good thing to do, somewhat related to niching, but more related to premier positioning, which I will cover another day. But if you can, if you can offer somebody, if you can make somebody's life really easy and do something really fast, people will pay an absolute fortune for that, especially if they have money to burn. If you can target rich people with a specific problem, you can basically name your price as long as you can show them the value. And even if that's not what you want to do, because not everybody wants to go after, you know, the, the rich people and blah, 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 and that's fine. But even if you're selling to a market that's got less money, you still need to apply these principles. You still need to choose your ideal reader, identify their problem and solve it for them and do it really, really well. Because quite apart from anything else, there's an ethical and, and kind of moral Im imperative, as far as I'm concerned, to do the best job that you possibly can for somebody. Hmm. It's not a question of persuading somebody to buy your shit. No. It's, a, it's a question of satisfying all of the things that they need from, from, from the thing that they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're solving a problem for people. I'm kind of going back to the whole marketing isn't, isn't a dirty word thing because you are solving somebody's problem and taking away their pain and that is not a bad thing to do. And there is no reason whatsoever that you shouldn't get paid for it and get paid a lot if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're targeting right and niching right and all the rest of it. So, you know, find your niche. Don't go after everybody. If you're a copywriter or a designer or anybody else, pick a niche within your wider market and figure out how to solve their very, very, very specific problems. And then charge a premium to do so. And people will pay a premium. Believe me, I know. Because one of my retainer clients pays me a very large amount of money every month to make his life very, very easy. Hmm. You know, I do all of the stuff that I do for him. I ask him the odd question, but it gets done. And because he trusts me to get on with it and, and do what I do well, he doesn't have to interfere and he doesn't have to get too involved. And, you know, I deliver stuff to him that's ready to go to print. And I make his life really easy. And that is why he pays me the big bucks. Yeah. Because it's just a whole chunk of his business he does not have to concern himself with. Yeah. Yeah, which leaves him free to concentrate on the projects that he really wants to work on. It's the same with another one of my retainer clients as well. It's just, it, it, and I enjoy it because I get almost autonomy to work on stuff that I enjoy because I'm trusted to do what I do well. And that's another bonus of niching. And but that's, that's because you've targeted that type of customer. Yes. Yes, I've targeted the type of customer who understands marketing and who understands copywriting and who doesn't feel the need to micromanage everything. Mm. Which, by the way, is a really strong lesson for copywriters and designers and freelancers. So, you know, like I said, I concentrate on, on those types of people for my private clients. I concentrate on freelancers for my inner circle. Not exclusively, but that's the type of person that my advertising is now aimed at. But what if you're not like me, uh, a marketing professional. Okay, my mate Paul shows personal trainers how to do marketing. That's his niche, and he's very, very good at it. Very good at it. He brings in, I think one of his um, one of his recent marketing campaigns brought him in 72 grand over a weekend. He's, you know, that, that's from niching. That's insane. I know. Or my mate Dev, who is rather frighteningly a surgeon. But he also, what he does is help doctors and surgeons grow their private medical practices. He teaches them how to market themselves. That's very specific niche. Mm -hmm. Or my friend Michelle, who sells dental gubbins to dental technicians and helps them grow their businesses. You might guess I don't really know what she does because it's quite technical, but, but that's what she does. You know, you've got to identify your niche within your market. Identify the very specific problem, market to it relentlessly, and charge a high price for it because if you are good at what you do and you are that specific and that niche you will be able to charge a high price and you should because you are worth it as l'oreal said because you're worth it and on that note <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna pour myself another glass of wine i'm gonna finish my gin and i'm gonna say merry merry christmas and a very happy new year to all of you yeah have a nice one folks yeah Ta <laughs> Like what you've just heard? Tell your colleagues. Tell your friends. Send them to www.businessforsuperheroes.com slash podcast.